Okay, good morning. Yeah. Can I what? Oh, the what wasn't posted. The last lecture was not posted. Oh, this? Yeah, we'll post it. Oh. Yeah, it'll be posted, but I gotta record it first. <laughs> I think this is lecture nine, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna look at some applications of uh, CT. It'll be heavily weighted towards cardiac applications because that's a lot of the data that I have, right? And um, so this is a CT image of a coronary artery, and um, you can see that there's some, obviously they've been messing with the reconstruction because there's obviously correlated noise here, some kind of blurring, etc. But this tissue here is fat. This is a contrast agent in the coronary arterial vessel. This is the left main, the left anterior descending. This is muscle, heart muscle itself. Uh, that little uh, signal there, uh, the brighter uh, signal, is a piece of calcium, presumably. You know, that I, I think you'd be right if you called that calcium 99 out of 100 times. And then uh, there's obviously some indentation, like this vessel is this uh, diameter here, and then it, it gets narrowed down here and quite narrow here. And so probably this region here is soft plaque, which is a, a lesion that's growing in, in the coronary artery. And so the whole thing, I mean, the, you know, the distance across here is probably about four millimeters, right? And so we're trying to resolve things that are about a millimeter across, something like that. Uh, ideally, you'd like to be able to resolve these things um, even smaller than that uh, because they start out very small. And you'd like to know you have these uh, calcium pieces uh, early on so you can uh, get on a statin and prevent heart attacks. You can, with, with modern CT scanners, we, all of the math that we've done with CT thus far really has been two-dimensional under the assumption that all our projections through theta and our sampling along L to get GL theta is a two-dimensional plane. And um, what occurs is, you know, to simplify it greatly, with a 256 slice scanner, 256 of those are done simultaneously, right? And they are about uh, a half millimeter apart to one millimeter apart, somewhere in there, depending on the on the manufacturer and the reconstruction. And so you get a, a whole volume. So this is a, a selection of a slice through that volume. You can pick an arbitrary plane. And in fact, you can pick a curved surface through that volume if, if the thing you're looking for is, is running along and through a curved surface. Usually, you, you pick planes to begin with. And uh, these yellow lines here are orthogonal planes to the plane that is viewed here. So if we cut the volume at a perpendicular to this, this imaging plane here, we see these pictures along here. And so <clears throat> right B is right through the lesion, right? So you can see that here's the lumen of the vessel. That's the piece of calcium. And then I imagine that there is some lesion out here, right? However, if you look at the actual signal, yeah, might be there, might not, right? I, I mean, it's hard to, to tell, actually. But my brain creates a lesion around that white dot. Um, if you go proximal, proximal means towards the source, right? So if you're, if you're traveling proximally up a river, you're going up, up the river right? <laughs> to its source. So um, if we go up the vessel to this wider part, we see this picture where we can appreciate the diameter of the vessel in its normal state. This is fat that we recall has a Hounsfield unit that's less than water, right? Uh, and this is muscle. 
This looks like uh, part of the aorta, which has contrast in it. Uh, so it's this, essentially the same intensity as the vessel. Um, and you can appreciate the open diameter of that vessel. And then as we go distal away from this lesion, we can see the diameter of this vessel gets uh, appreciably smaller here. This is the left anterior descending. So it gives you a lot of data, a lot of geometry data about the vessel, right? Almost, when you're looking at it uh, visually, it's almost too much to take in visually all, all at once. It's hard to, to sort of see the whole picture. Um, and that's why we'll, we'll take, I think I have a slide on it, do I? Yeah. We'll take a look at what you can do to simulate blood flow through this geometry to try and uh, help evaluate whether or not that geometry is a bad thing, a really bad thing, or just a, a kind of bad thing for this patient. Yes? So can you do it with time work? Can you like, visualize the contrast lesion going in and then measure flow? Like, that's, that's a very good question, and that's done in a lot of image, medical imaging uh, modalities, is you inject the contrast and you dynamically image as the contrast is filling cavities, right? And or filling vessels, and you ask the question, what is the... Uh, blood flow, the absolute blood flow would be given in milliliters per gram per minute, right? So how much blood goes into a gram of tissue per minute? And uh, that can be done with certain imaging techniques like MRI is very good at that because the contrast goes through the vessels and then diffuses into the tissue and you can measure the signal change. CT is not so great at that. Um, and Traditionally, CT was a little too slow to do that. Uh, you couldn't get enough pictures per unit time to really appreciate it. But we'll see that now you can sort of measure perfusion in tissues. To try and measure this vessel getting brighter over time is a, is a really good PhD project, right? Because now we have scanners that are actually have the temporal capability of, of measuring that signal, but modeling what the signal looks like for an x-ray CT contrast agent going into a vessel is not easy. And the reason it's not easy is because the, the contrast agent itself is very viscous and very heavy. In fact, I should have brought up a picture of this. If you take a syringe full of CT contrast and you have a, a, a cup, right, and you, and you put the syringe over the cup and you you squirt the contrast in at the top and then you run out and press go. You don't want to stand there while it's scanning, right? Because you get irradiated. So you just go whoop and get out of there, press go. You see the contrast agent just fall to the bottom of the cup. It just, it just descends down in, in a stream, hits the bottom and roils around in the bottom because it's so, it has so much uh, higher density than water and blood. So the actual flow of this contrast agent isn't a simple thing to model. But I had a postdoc working on it. Right on, on measuring flow, given these crazy patterns that you're going to see through your thing. Yep. Yeah. Ideally, if if it was just it had the density of blood, and you could measure it fast enough, you could use traditional fluid mechanics to figure out what the flows were at any point. When the densities are not the same, it, it actually turns out traditional fluid mechanics doesn't work that well for that, and it, that fluid mechanics is yet to be invented. So that's angiography, and that's CT for imaging small things that are moving, okay, which is a, is a sort of a challenging thing. Principally what CT is used for, if, if, we, if I look at the scanner, um, in the hospital and I just go down the, sh the sheet for a week and see what, what did they image this week. On, on our scanner, the one that we have for our, our stuff, it's about 35% is cardiac, right? Because it's the cardiac scanner. The rest of it is cancer. And pay they basically scan people's body at high resolution to look for metastasis of cancer or primary tumors, right? And you put contrast in and you look for those things. Yes? That's a great question, and there's a whole subculture and subfield of radiology that is 
um, uh, intent on making contrast agents that will stick to tumors. Okay, so the original question, so I'm going to repeat it because it's being recorded, is like, what do you target on the tumor, or what, how do you make a contrast agent so it targets the tumor so it lights up, right? And that's a tricky problem. Uh, there's uh, a lot of um, um, uh, basically monoclonal type of antibodies that are trying to grow up to, to attach to markers on the surface, cell surface of tumors and things like that. And if you can attach something to that you know, monoclonal that is, say, a PET agent, then that thing will, will be bright and, and you'll see the tumor and that, and that can be successful. Yeah. Right. Right. So the question is, what's the off-target false positive rate? So you've got this this contrast agent goes in and it sticks to tumors, but it also sticks to other stuff, which is uh, is usually going to happen. You're absolutely right, and um, that that's a problem. It it depends entirely on the agent and how well it's fit for that tumor, and it depends on the tumor, right? And all not all tumors are created equal. In fact. One could argue, no one tumor is alike, right? Because they all have their own sort of spectrum of, of you know, mutations and are going to express all different sorts of things on their surface. And then they evolve over time, like quickly over time, to hide themselves from the immune system, to do all this stuff. So you're chasing a, a moving target when you're trying to image these things. And then there's a field called Theranostics, which, you know, Half the group making contrast agents to stick to tumors said, well, heck, if they're sticking to tumors, let's attach something that's like a payload to kill the tumor, right? Because if it's sticking to the tumor, just kill what it's sticking to. And so that's a whole other field as well. And so you can see where your payload goes and, and then how toxic it is, etc. So that's most of what CT scanning in a, in a major teaching hospital that has a big cancer unit, that's what they're going to be scanning a lot of. Um, Cardiac-wise, another uh, very uh, frequent scan is this calcium scan. And, and I think we looked at this before where we have three people, say each person's 50 years old, and they have exactly the same risk factors to have cardiac disease or not, in the sense that their blood pressure, their age, whether they're a smoker, whether their family's had a history, all of those normal risk factors are absolutely equal, right? And so you would, when they walk in the door, you give them all an equal probability of having a heart attack in the next 10 years. And then you throw them in the CT scanner and do a very low dose uh, simple gated acquisition with no contrast injection and these are the three images that come out for the three people. This person has a clean coronary artery with absolutely no calcium seen in there. This person has a little bit of calcium in their LAD and this person is just loaded up with calcium in a ton of vessels, right? And so now it's, it's sort of like Schrodinger's cat. You've opened the box, you know who's got coronary disease. All those other factors, you can just pretty well forget about them, right, other than age, right, and, and just go on this and say, oh, you know, you're growing lesions, you've grown a lot already, you know, because there's so much calcium here, you need aggressive lifestyle change if you're smoking and eating too much, etc., and not exercising, and we should put you on a statin. Right? And so that, that risk factor then becomes uh, uh, sort of fully dependent on this image, right? And you can see that these are, these are all of the biomarkers that have been used recently and invented recently to predict whether or not somebody's going to have a heart attack. And these are middle risk people, sort of in their 50s and et cetera. Um, and the Framingham risk score, which is the classic one that everybody uses, is this blue curve. It doesn't really matter which blue curve. It's one of these because they're all terrible. Uh, but this is the false positive fraction versus the sensitivity, true positive fraction. And so as, as you crank up your uh, threshold for detecting 
uh, whether or not a person is going to have a heart attack, you increase the rate of false positives that you call. Right? So as I get better, like say I capture 50% of the people that will have a heart attack at that Framingham risk score, when I look down, I'm also you know, capturing a whole ton of people, 35%, who were predicted to have heart attacks who won't have heart attacks. Right? So that's a false positive. And so ideally, these curves, this is called an ROC curve, and we're going to look at it in a, just a little bit of detail right now. This is the normal distribution. This is the fraction of patients that are normal. And say that you say you got a line of people coming into your clinic, and they're divided into normals and abnormals. You don't know who's who. Right? This is the distribution of a parameter value in the normals. This is the distribution of that parameter value in the abnormals. Right? And so it's shifted. The mean is higher in the abnormals. So maybe it's their calcium score. Right? It's shifted up in the abnormals. When you decide to, to call someone abnormal based on a threshold of that count, say their, their calcium score is 50, and you say, I'm going to call everybody who has calcium above 50, I'm going to call them abnormal. Right? Then you're going to capture a, a fraction of the normals as false positives. Right? And uh, this fraction are the true positives. These are the people that you have given correct information to. You're saying, you know what, you, you are going to have a heart attack in 10 years based on, on this score. This group, they didn't have a heart attack in 10 years, right? So these are the folks who fell below your threshold and did have heart attacks, so they're basically false negatives. You said, oh, don't worry. And however, they went on and had a heart attack. And then these are the true negatives, or the, or the normals under there. As you move this threshold from a very stringent, or you, know, you have to have a really high number to be abnormal, you get very few um, false positives and a lot of true negatives, but you also get a lot of false negatives, right? And as you move that down, you draw out this curve. Okay? And so the, this curve is kind of captures the ability of that test to differentiate the true positives and the false positives, et cetera. Right? This is called a receiver operating characteristic curve, and it's used in imaging a lot. Right? And the reason it's used is because you have these outcomes, you know, the truth, and you get people to, to make decisions you know, based on, on their own personal belief whether or not somebody's positive. One person doesn't behave like another person. Like they, people have different thresholds. They just behave differently. Some people have to really see something strongly positive in order to call it, and other people call it just in case. Right? So it's the behavior of the radiologist gets, gets thrown into the statistics. And if you're trying to evaluate which imaging system is better, you don't really want to evaluate the behavior of the radiologist. You'd like to evaluate just the, the underlying distribution, your ability to differentiate those, those things. Your imaging or your clinical tests create these two distributions. Right? That's what you really want to find, are these two distributions. You don't, you don't really want to evaluate people and how they set this threshold. And so that ROC curve is based totally on these underlying distributions, and you can measure it experimentally. And when you look at that ROC curve, so here's the ROC curves. Oh, well, first of all, let's, let's look at what's a good place. The best place to be on, the best curve to have for an imaging system would be you're capturing more and more true positives without moving into the false positive domain. So this curve would go higher and higher and higher and higher. Say we get 90% true positive fraction with only a 8% false positive fraction. That's an impossibly good test, right? It rarely happens that it comes up here and then it curves along there. So the farther you get to this corner, the better, right? If you sit along this line, this is flipping a coin. 
right? So if I'm sitting here and I get just as many true positives and just as many false positives, I may as well just flip a coin, right? If you're down here, I don't know what's going on. It's like your test is pointing you in the wrong direction. You should do the opposite of what you think the test is telling you, okay? So the really cool thing about calcium scanning, and this has just been shown in the last five years, 10 years, I mean, they've been collecting data for a long time. They've been collecting data for 20 years on calcium scanning. But now all, you know, half the people that they started collecting data on in the 80s, they're all dead, right? And so they, you know the outcome at this point, right? So did they die of heart disease or did they not die of heart disease? And so you can draw a curve that shows the fraction of people who will have a heart attack, right? And your ability to predict that. So these are all the Framingham risk score and then all of these are different uh, tests, you know, that have been proposed to be really sensitive biomarkers for uh, cardiac disease, like, you know, uh, basically intimate media thickness measured in your carotid and all this kind of stuff. And they all sit down here, and then this is calcium up here. Right? So it just crushes them all. Yeah? So how do they calculate the calcium score? That's a great question. So you just, basically, you find all of the pixels that are above a certain threshold, and, mo and for the classic calcium score, it's above 130 Hounsfield units on a non-contrast scan. So you haven't put any contrast in the patient, so everything should be fairly low in terms of Hounsfield units below. If it rises above 130, you just count each one of those pixels. And in, there's some special stuff about, are they connected pixels or separate if they're connected you include them. If there's one pixel that's out there, you let it go. And you just integrate up all this stuff, and you come up with a score. And zero is a really good score. That means you don't have any calcium. And that's, that's hugely protective, right? So if you have zero, it's, it's a great, great news. Um, and then 50 to 100 is like low calcium. You're just, just not getting started growing lesions, you know, just on your way. And then 1,000 is you're... you're you're a mature lesion grower, and you got to watch out. And, you know, people in their 70s and stuff have calcium scores of 1,000, right? And they just go up with age, basically. Everybody grows calcium. It's just when you start and how much you grow, right? Or virtually everybody. There's a few people out there that don't, right? But, so anyway, you can image it like that. I mean, in 140 milliseconds, basically, whoop, you've got all of this data, very low dose, and it's like the best biomarker for heart disease. And so it's a great use of a CT scanner. And these are, I just guessed at these. I know the guy who made this curve and we talked about it. And the, these are sort of the, where you would put your threshold for the calcium score. If you said anyone above 10 is gonna have a heart attack, you'd catch virtually 90% of people, but you'd also include 60% of the normals, right, as false you know, positives. Calcium score of 100 is here, calcium score 400 here. So now you're catching 60 with only 20% false positives, right? So it is a terrific use of, of CT. Yeah. And in this case, the calcium, so when you call your threshold at 1,000, it means everybody else in between. The, the reason why it's so low is because you're not accounting for everybody else that might have a heart Correct. They, if you say, I, if you have calcium over a thousand, I'm going to predict you have you're going to have a heart attack. You know, you you capture thirty percent, right? But and you only include like ten percent. So you, as you relax your threshold, right, then you 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 get bigger and bigger integrals under those two parts of the curve. If we go back to this curve, right, right, as we relax our threshold down here. Right, we're starting to include more and more on this in the false positives and the true positives. Right? So I'm rolling my threshold down, I get larger integrals, but you know. ideally these two curves are entirely separate. Right? And then it's trivial. You just put your threshold right between them, and all the all the people on one side are negative, all the people on the other side are positive. Right? Well, that never happens really in biology in medicine. So the other thing uh, you can do with high-resolution CT data, if you are able to either capture the vessels, 
when they're stationary or relatively stationary. So your heart goes through periodic motion, but there's a phase of a few hundred milliseconds when after the ventricle fills, it kind of sits there in a, in a relatively stationary state, static state. And if you p make your picture there inside that 200 milliseconds, then there isn't a heck of a lot of motion and it's not blurred by motion. You can also do motion correction. If we get that successfully, uh, and this is why this is why wider scanners are better because you can get the whole heart in one rotation and why you want to rotate that gantry as fast as you can because you want to get all that data as fast as you can. Right? Uh, and so then you get a, a volume of CT data and you can extract out just by doing some kind of thresholding or really smart extraction of, of pixel classification to say what's a vessel and what's not a vessel, right? And if you answer that question and then put all the pixels that are vessels along here, you get a, a nice three-dimensional model of that person's coronary anatomy. And then you can go into computational fluid dynamics and say, okay, for, a tu for tubes that look like this and with uh, using physiology and looking at the amount of tissue that's there and you say what's the demand, the amount of fluid that you go through there, what do I expect the, the flow to look like? All right, just based on the geometry. We haven't got any dynamics about the intensity of pixels changing across here. We just like look at the geometry and say if I was to push a pressure head at the top of that geometry, what would the pressure look like as I go down the tube? Right? And you map as you go down the tube, you, you map both the velocity of the blood and you map the pressure. They, you know, as you, as, as you have a pressure head at the top of a hose, the pressure drops as you go down the, the tube, right? And then if you basically put a stenosis in that hose, so you, you get something and you crimp it down, the pressure will actually go through a discrete, a, quite a rapid drop on the other side of that stenosis. And so that's become sort of the official uh, marker for whether or not you have a significant stenosis. It's called uh, fractional flow reserve and you put a, tr a pressure transducer in the patient's coronary artery. It's a tiny little wire and you measure the pressure as you go down the vessel. As you cross a lesion, if that pressure drops, goes through a 20% drop as you cross the lesion, then you say that lesion is significant. That thing was narrow enough to cause me concern. So we should put a stent there. We should repair this thing. Right? And that's called fractional flow reserve. It is now the gold standard for determining whether or not you need a stent. And so here's some example 3D CT. Here's a coronary vessel. This is the LAD again. It looks like it almost disappears entirely here, so it's getting quite narrow. Uh, you can look at it in a cross-sectional view, and you can see that there's a, geometrically this indentation there. And then on the x-ray fluoroscopy, you see that that is essentially validated by the fact that there is a lesion there. So this is a lot wider, or the diameter is a lot larger than here, which is unnatural. It's supposed to start with the maximum diameter and then decrease its diameter as it goes down. There. Again, this is all geometric morphology, and that's what we're doing with these imaging techniques is measuring the geometry. We're not measuring the dynamics or the flow dynamics. The other interesting thing that, and this is a reason why CT research still on, is ongoing and why people are still trying to make better and better scanners, is that just knowing the diameter of the lumen of the vessel, so just where the blood is, is you know good information. But if you knew what the lesion itself was composed of, that would give you even more information as to whether or not that lesion is dangerous. You'd really like to pick off the lesions that are going to cause that person trouble, right? If you can leave it alone. If they have some lesion in there, and everybody does by the time they're 55 or 60, right? But some of them are small, right? If you can leave it alone, that's a good thing. 
for a lot of statin, and you know they're not going to die from sudden death jogging or something like that. Right? It's kind of rolling the dice. It's, it is sort of a you know, probabilistic thing. However, certain lesions look like they're more dangerous than others. And so if you could actually image the characteristics of the lesion, then you could start classifying lesions into different groups and saying, who are the really dangerous lesions? And some of the plaque types that have been um, visualized, and, and in order for this visualization to happen, a lot of things have to go right. The contrast injection has to be perfectly timed in this patient. The heart rate has to be such that the heart was really stationary while we're making the picture, so there's no blurring. Um, the patient ideally is quite slim because the, you can get a lot of x-rays into the vessel. If, if it's a big person that has a BMI of over 30, then a lot of the x-rays are gone by the time they get to the heart, and so the signals and noise is not great. And there's no turning back, right? You just, you gotta either crank up more x-rays, right, or, or deal with poor, poor pictures. So I, all of these pictures where you see these ridiculously gorgeous, uh, you know, resolved things, these are probably in pretty thin people, right? At 120 kV or something. So here you can resolve that there's a, a plaque. So the vessel doesn't really change its diameter that much. In fact, this lesion probably doesn't cause any flow change at all. all right? So you wouldn't have a symptom. It's not going to cause you pain. It's not going to cause any kind of ischemia. Right? And so this person would not show up in the hospital as a candidate for evaluating their heart disease because there would be no evidence of that heart disease other than this picture. Right? And so there's the a big soft plaque lesion. It's probably an early lesion. This is a similar type of lesion where you have this soft tissue here with a little bit of calcium right in the middle of it. This is someone who's been growing lesions up and down this vessel for a number of years. And so you get injury and then repair. And then when the repair occurs, it, it sort of lays down this level of uh, calcium. And it's almost like your own personal stent. Right? This, it, it gets really hard and calcified, and it, it actually stabilizes the lesion. It's not such a bad thing to have this. It just shows that you're growing lesions, but the actual physics of the flow and everything after this is laid down, a lot of people just carry on just fine with them. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a heart attack, but as we saw with the CAC data, it puts you in a group that's higher probability. Um, this, uh, where's... This is a, a really bad looking lesion. I'll just do one more. So this is the lumen here. That's where the contrast agent is. And we've cut the vessel axially, so we're looking at the vessel straight on. There's some faded signal here, so there's some kind of you know, tissue there. And then you can see the outside of the vessel, and then there's this really dark spot here. So. The hypothesis, I say this is a hypothesis because it's hard to get truth data, right? The hypothesis is that this is a lipid core. It's like a liquid lipid core that, that is inside this soft plaque. And that means that this is at a, at a phase at which it is quite susceptible to causing a, a small, almost ulcerous hole in the lesion right here, and as soon as that hole occurs, then you have massive thrombus, right? Because basically your, your system wants to clot that up, and you get a big blood clot right here, which grows, and then the whole thing fills up really quickly, shuts down the entire vessel. And so that, that basically is a massive heart attack, right? Because the whole vessel gets filled. Someone in this situation, you know, they could be on their treadmill or their or their bicycle and they're just like man I just can't I just can't do my 70 mile ride anymore I don't know what's going on and they they actually reduce physiologically because they can't achieve the blood flow that they're used to but they didn't they don't die um, sort of suddenly they just you know slow down and uh, but this is potentially a very serious situation so people are trying to characterize these the the deal is 
I don't know, maybe 20% of CT scans have the image quality that you need to identify these different parts. And so we need better scanners, right? Just need to get out, get the image faster, get the image with better signal to noise in the data, higher resolution detectors, higher resolution spot size, all that stuff has to get better. Um, here's a classic looking stenosis, you know, where it basically, you don't really see a, a change in the diameter, you just see a change in the signal intensity, right? This is the integration of that, that signal. This is a positive remodeled lesion, so it's, it's a bad thing if the lesion comes outside and into the fat. It grows a bump on the outside of the vessel. That's called positive remodeling. Uh, that's the, this is called the napkin ring sign, I guess, because it looks like a napkin ring, etc. Okay, so let's look at uh, some image quality issues. So we're trying to resolve these lesions, right? Trying to resolve these small things. And we can look at a couple of comparisons. So here's uh, a person imaged, and the x-ray tube was set at 700 MA. Okay, so for our scanner, 700 MA right now is pretty well the maximum amount of electron current you can put on that tube. And so it's generating the maximum flux of x-rays that we can see. The, uh, down the pike, you know, our next tube that we buy, and these things are like 100 grand, the next tube we buy will probably be 1400 MA, right? So they've been working on this for a lot to try and just like make it a brighter lamp so that you can get more x-rays faster. Right. If you look at what does the reconstructed image look like, and this, is, this goes to that MATLAB thing that I gave you to look at signal to noise. What does the reconstruction look like if you use a tenth of that? Right? And th this is the image that is exactly the same spot. Okay? And <clears throat> the way this was done is that it, there's two ways. One, either we took this data, which has very high signal to noise, and we just added noise to it such that it became this data. Right? Added random signal onto the raw data such that it looks like data from 70 MA. Right? Or occasionally what can happen is when you're taking an image over a certain period in the heart cycle and the, the scanner will turn on to 700 MA and then it shuts down, it ramps down the, the x-rays and as it's ramping down you can go out there and actually reconstruct pictures out there. You don't usually show them to a physician because they, it's while the x-rays are being turned off, right? Uh, but you can get pictures where you have these low MAs uh, in a patient. Uh, and so if you look at the difference here, there doesn't look like there's a heck of a lot of difference between those two pictures, right? So this is literally just this image minus this one, right, is this picture, right? So there's structure to the difference, right? And so there's some structure to that that noise. And you can see the places where the difference is really apparent, like right here, there's some kind of structure. And that's obviously this edge right here. Right? There's a really nice depiction of that edge there. Here, the edge kind of is obviously a little blurred. And in the difference, it shows up. That gets really apparent when we move down into the coronary. And this person actually has a stent in their coronary. So it's a high contrast, very sharp, high-resolution structure. Another reason to make really high-resolution pictures is you'd like to image inside the stent, see what's going on in there, right? And because uh, sometimes people grow thrombus in the stent and the stent starts to, to shut down. Uh, so here's the picture of the stent. This is the picture at 70 MA, and you can see what the difference is. It's just that this, the edges of this get quite blurred with the lower signal to noise and you, sh you wind up basically with an edge image as your, as your difference. So, you know, there are certain things you can do with this picture though, right? If you were to ask, what we really need right now is to know the left ventricular volume, the blood. So we'll, we'll measure the ejection fraction. So we just need the volume of blood and the LV. So all you do is add up the bright pixels, 
right? And that gives you the volume. Using this data, you're going to get a very accurate answer because there's so many pixels involved and you're adding up so many and the errors are going to start canceling out at the edges. So you get a really good number for one-tenth of the radiation. However, if, you're, if your task is not that, your task is how does the LED look right here, right? When you look at this, well, you're done. You, just, you can't. Right? So, so it really depends on the, on the task at hand. And your ROC curve for getting to the truth would be completely different depending on the task, right? So you have to keep that in mind when you're, when you're evaluating a picture for image quality. It's like, what do you want to do with the picture? So if we look, if we zoom this up, so you can see the dimension of the pixels here. Uh, there's the stent uh, sort of at a, at a bit of an oblique angle, and that's what it looks like with the signal to noise of 70 MA. So it's, it's a much more difficult thing to evaluate. So what does motion look like? I don't know if we, if we looked at this yet. Um, obviously, the vessels move during... Uh, cardiac contraction because they sit, the, the big part of the vessels sit inside the groove between the, these are the atria up here and the ventricle down here. This is the left ventricle, the right ventricle is over here. This is the right atrium and then the, this is a little bit of the left atrium right here. And the right coronary artery over here sits in this major groove and so it's moving up and down with the, the motion of the heart as the heart contracts. So essentially when the heart contracts, it exchanges volume between the lower chamber. As you eject this blood out to the lungs, you get blood coming from the IVC and the SVC into the right atrium, right? So they, it's just basically exchanging volume like a squeeze box, right? And so there's a plane along here, the valve plane, that's moving <coughs> up and down as that's occurring. And therefore you get a lot of motion of these vessels at, at two times during the cardiac cycle. Once when it's ejecting, and once when it's relaxing. And you can see the characteristic motion artifacts, right? So when the heart's stationary and we can image it, while it's still in the same configuration, we get really nice dots that are cross sections of those vessels. And then when it's in motion, they turn into pretty crazy looking pictures, right? Some of them look like swirls, you know, others are just streaks across. And, and that all depends on what the motion is with respect to the gantry position you know, as that motion is occurring. So the gantry is going around, right? And if it starts moving at a certain part of that arc, you're going to get a completely different looking artifact, right? So <clears throat> you have to deal with these. The way we deal with them is we image it one of two phases. We image either here or here, right? So end diastole, when the ventricle just filled, or end systole, when the ventricle just emptied itself. Right? So end systole is when this chamber is the smallest, and diastole is when it's the biggest. And so here's, you know, an uncorrected uh, axial view. This is the aorta, the left atrium, left ventricle. And you can see in this plane, those chambers are coming in and out of the plane. So they're moving out of the field of view and coming back in. Like the ventricle here is going down and out and then back up in. And here's the right coronary artery. And you can see it's you know, generating a lot of motion artifact while it's moving around. This is what it looks like if you use a method that reconstructs the image under the assumption that this thing is moving. So you can correct your sinogram data in order to model the underlying motion. So you say, okay, if I have a disk and I take my sinogram data and look at it, that's one thing. Now if I have a disk that's moving linearly across the field of view, what does that sinogram data look like? It's quite different, right? It actually, it's going to basically change. It's not going to be a single sine wave given its position. It's going to change its frequency as it's, as it's moving. Well, you can just apply that transformation to the raw data and that thing will come into snap into focus right because it you're basically tracking it other stuff that isn't moving like that that's a 
that's also affected by that part of the sinogram will, will get all motion artifacted, but your target can come back into focus. And we'll take a look at some sinograms and uh, talk about that. So any, any questions about that? So like, I would say that's the principal uh, issue with CT, and it's the principal reason why when you write a paper, or write a grant, and say, oh, we're going to do the following with CT, it comes back and say, oh, you can't do that with CT because CT isn't fast enough. Like, people just believe that in their head. They haven't, they haven't sort of caught up to where modern CT is. And so they say, oh, you have to use ultrasound because CT is not fast enough. Right? And it's just a common held belief. And if you asked 80% of cardiologists, they would tell you. Right? So it's an it's it's imaging modality that's sort of uh, coming into its own in terms of uh, fast scanning. So uh, perfusion is something you can image uh, with CT, and that is uh, perfusion of a, of a tissue. So here's the left ventricle of the heart, this thing here. This is the right ventricle. I don't know if this is a movie. Let me see if it's a, if it's a movie. Oh, yeah, it is good. But it doesn't work. Not too bad. Um, so, shucks. If we could see that movie, what would happen, you would see the dynamics of the, of the contrast coming into the left ventricle and into the myocardium, right? And if you plotted the signal intensity as a function, say, in some little region of interest or box, the Hounsfield units would increase in time and then decrease right, as, it, as the contrast bolus passes by. And that measuring that dynamic, the increase, particularly this upslope, is proportional to the amount of blood flow in, in that tissue. So if you can get a really good estimate of that upslope here, uh, then you can you can make an estimate of the perfusion in the tissue. Now, this uh, imaging sequence, as you can see, images the heart multiple times, right? Because it has to, th this is a process that takes seconds. So essentially, the, the clock for this process is the heartbeat. Because each time the heart contracts, it's going to push the blood downstream and so you you may as well image once per heartbeat because the dynamics is going to change once per heartbeat and so the contrast will go up and it'll go up again and it'll go up again as as you're pushing the blood and so uh, you know you take an image of this heartbeat here's the EKG patient's EKG image here wait one beat image here every other heartbeat for some time and then perhaps out at this part, you image like every fourth heartbeat because things aren't happening as fast. You know. The issue, though, is you're making a lot of pictures, right? And so your dose is sort of building up with each picture, and you have to try and make each one of these pictures with as minimum dose as possible. And so from your simulations that you've been doing with your little, with the squares and stuff like that, You've tried deleting data, which, which is essentially equivalent to just not taking it, right? So let's not take data in certain parts and, and see what the picture looks like. Can we get away with that? It's a big question, right? If, I, if you threw up a CT image like this one, and we said, I'm, we're going to collect 20 of these to get perfusion, I said, well, that image is kind of too good for the task because really what I want to do is image the mean value of the signal in this big chunk here. I probably don't need a picture this good. Can I do it with half as many views and still get an accurate estimate for the mean value in the myocardium? Can I do it with a tenth as many views? Right? And if I can do it with a tenth as many views, then I'm when I put all my 20 pictures together, it's basically the dose of just two pictures. So it's a big question. What's the best way to reconstruct it when you have limited views? Right? And or do you take the same number of views, just drop the x-ray fluence way down? Right? So 
So here you have a model with the Hounsfield unit brightness in, say, the left ventricular cavity over time. It goes up to something quite bright because it's, it's a high concentration inside the LV, right? And then this is the amount of change of the Hounsfield unit in the tissue, right, over time. Right? And so we, we see it tracks up as the ventricle is getting brighter, the tissue also gets brighter, and we measure this slope and come up with an estimate of perfusion as a function of position in the heart. So here's, here's my left ventricle, these are the coronary arteries, and then this blue stuff tells me the perfusion is low there and it's normal over here. And you can try and do this quantitatively such that you get milliliters per gram per minute of flow. Uh, and so here in this patient we see that you know the primary question we've Image their, their coronary arteries, you got a great picture, and we saw stenosis. I say, is that stenosis significant? Is that what's causing them their pain? You don't actually know that because a lot of things cause pain in the chest, right? So you want to really know, is that stenosis what's causing them this, this pain? Well, if you stress them in the sense that you either make them ride a bike or you give them a drug that increases blood flow, and what happens is this perfusion drops out under stress. Then you say, okay, that, that lesion is causing this problem, right? We, we got issues here. And so that's confirmation that you should go in there and probably fix that thing, right? Interesting aside, when you compare people who get optimal drug therapy, even people like this that have a confirmed lesion that's flow limiting, if you put them on optimal drug therapy versus going in and putting a stent in, right, a stent seems to make a ton of sense, right, because you open it up, this perfusion map gets normal, right, when you image their vessel, it's open, and, you know, I look at that and you go, oh my goodness, that would be a better place to be, right. Then you ask the question, are you going to live any longer on average? There's big trials we've done say, these people got stents, these people got optimal therapy. Right? And the answer is no. Right? Which, which is a shocking answer to me, but anyway, that's, that's what the answer is in a couple of trials. The one's called Courage, and I encourage you to read it. Yeah? Yes. So, I mean, it's like not an invasive procedure. So, like, if you're talking about the cost of surgery or like the cost of taking drugs or out of a lucid person, like not like taking drugs, they want to spend. Right. Like, is there? I mean, it's it's not like saying that because it's either better than drugs or better, right? It's kind of is it personal preference essentially? Yes. So the question is: so if there is no demonstrable benefit to life expectancy between getting a stent put in, which is a, is a sort of a minimally invasive procedure. It's, you don't crack your chest. You, it just goes up a vessel and they plug it in. Um, so is it at that point just a decision for the physician and the patient and their personal preference? And to a certain extent it is. Um, and People have, have tried to demonstrate that, say, symptoms get better, which they should, right? If, if the perfusion deficit goes away, your pain should go away and things like that. And th that data is a little, a little tricky, too. It's not, it's not a super clear-cut thing. So uh, the one uh, study, and it was, it was called the FAME-2 trial, that showed a clear difference when you get a stent versus not getting a stent is if they, remember, think back a few sides. If that fractional flow reserve is positive, so when you measure the pressure and it drops more than 20%, you could only do this study in, in Europe. Even in people where it dropped like that and they saw the lesion on the film, they randomized them to optimal drug therapy versus a stent. They didn't give a stent to people who had these tight lesions and, and had 
obvious positive FFR. The people who did not get the stent by huge numbers wound up back in the hospital to, to have some procedure done, right? They wound up like crushing pain and oh my God, I'm having a big heart attack. Not a huge, like there was some mortality difference, but it wasn't huge. But a lot of those people wound up back at the hospital, right? If they didn't get the stent. And so that, that's why now it's generally believed that if you're FFR, if you do that measurement, and that pressure drops more than 20% as you cross that lesion, you should stent that lesion. And so that's, that's a given now, pretty well. Yeah? If the lesion is large enough, wouldn't putting your uh, pressure transducer through also affect it? Yeah, good. I mean, that's a good point. Uh, I think if the lesion is that tight, you're probably going to have a positive result anyway, but because uh, these things are pretty pretty small. But that's that's true. I mean, for tight lesions, yeah. Is there a certain point at which you would discuss coronary graft, or is the stent technology just have, has it made it completely obsolete? No, absolutely not. Um, so the question is, has stenting vessels made coronary bypass grafts obsolete? And the answer is absolutely not. And if you have triple vessel disease, like you have three lesions and they're in all three of your major vessels, nobody stents those. You go, you get cabbage, right? And if you have disease in your left main, which is that the big one that goes to the LAD and the and the circ, if there's a big lesion in there, you don't touch that with a stent. You usually bypass that thing, right? And so the, that's that's the practice now. So. Understanding where those lesions are with high resolution and understanding which ones are significant is an important workup for determining which way you should go, right? And so that's why these pictures should get better. Like we should just be able to just, when they come to the, to the ER and people are in chest, have chest pain, there should be no hesitation. What they should do is a CT and it should return all the information you need to determine what, what's the trajectory of that person for their cardiovascular health. Yeah? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get a map. Let me show you what it looks like. Because you have this beautiful map, right, of the coronaries. And so it looks like this. This is like straight up what it looks like when it's returned to the physician. It's a, it's a map of the patient's coronaries and a color-coded pressure map on that. And then the patient and the physician decide, okay, is this pressure drop enough? Should we do a stent, right? And this, this was just FDA approved maybe three years ago, something like that, because the CT images just got good enough to, to actually do this reproducibly. Um, okay, motion artifact, perfusion, um, and now this is left ventricular function. So you can do this with MR, you can do it with echo. Uh, to a certain extent, you can do it with single photon emission tomography or SPECT, but that's, those are really blurry pictures. But CT, if you're, if you're making an image every 140 milliseconds, right, and you can actually reconstruct by sharing views every 100 milliseconds, you get 10 frames over the heart cycle that are you know, different. And you play them back and you get these movies of any plane. You can just orient this uh, picture into any plane through the heart. And so these are the traditional views that are taken with echocardiography that I'm showing here. The echocardiographer puts the transducer on the chest and gets three short axis views through the heart, base, mid, and apex. And then they put the transducer down here and look up and get three long axis views uh, this is called the parasternal, this is a four chamber, and this is a two chamber. And they're just at different angles around the heart. And so with CT, you can make an infinite number of these views. I mean, we could do six different levels, we could do 12 different angles, whatever we want. But normally when you hand this to a cardiologist, they'll look at it and go, oh, this is terrific. And they know pretty well what's going on right, in, in the patient. And uh, so this can be achieved, again, 
in a you know one heartbeat scan right whereas echo takes many many minutes and moving the transducer around and the tech has to be really good etc this is a is a simple sort of boop, one heartbeat and you're done kind of scan and it, you know that's what the underlying data looks like it, it's functional data where the brightness is the contrast agent in the chamber and we've just cut cut arbitrary view not arbitrary we've cut views through there to represent what you would see on echocardiography in cardiology Here's an example of a patient who came into a study looking at uh, left ventricular function under anthracycline therapy. Uh, it turns out that some cancer therapies give you cardiomyopathy, and so we're trying to detect that early. And uh, so this patient, we put him in the scanner, and then we looked at him, it was like obviously abnormal, right? There's tissue that's really thin here. It's not contracting here. It's bulging out. Uh, on the short axis, you can see it's actually just sort of a... a thin piece of tissue left up here. This guy was called normal on echo. Right? You just, you know, they just missed it because it's like way up in here. It's really hard to see on echo. Right? It's way up, it's far away from the transducer, signal to noise ain't great. But it's it's trivially abnormal on this, right? Like a eight-year-old could call this thing abnormal. Right? Uh, and then when you have a super duper abnormal one, let's see if is this going to work? Uh, so this is a patient who is being considered for mitral valve replacement, right? And uh, because you can see their mitral valve is not working all that great here. But you also can see that part of their ventricle is just pretty well gone, right? So it's, it's now down here to this really thin layer this is probably uh, all, you know, sort of a scar tissue after a large infarct, right? The great thing about, about uh, human beings is they're pretty tough, right? You can knock out a whole bunch of blood to their heart, and if they don't die from electrical abnormality, they'll trundle along and survive, right? And, but they'll have a big infarct here. And, uh, so, but this person probably knew this was here because this is a big one. Uh, but then when you look at the... The 3D rendering of their ventricle, ventricle contracting, here's the LV, and there's this thing right here. It's pretty easy to see that that baseball size thing or golf ball there just is not contracting, right? It's just getting pushed around by the rest of the heart, but it's not contracting. And so in the 3D mode, you can just go in here, let's put it on end systole, like here, where it's supposed to be contracted down, and you just mark where that lesion is, right? That's, that's where that infarct is. It's pretty simple. Um, I wanted to just run, we're not gonna do that. Uh, so this is left atrial function, and, and people have, do not use CT for this, but I think it's coming, or I'd like it. We're gonna try and push it. This thing here, this is the left atrium. When, it, when you're in, a patient has left atrial fibrillation. Maybe so your grandparents or something had this, and they had to go to the hospital and get shocked out of, of AFib, it's called. It's a common thing as you get older. And sometimes you go on drugs to prevent it. But when this goes into fibrillation, it loses this contraction ability. And so this thing here, which is called the left atrial appendage, loses its ability to do what it's doing right there, which is contracting, like it's squeezing down, shooting blood out. Uh, it's like this little side pocket on the left atrium. It's like a pressure release valve or something. And, uh, but what happens in, a in AFib is 80% to 90% of the strokes that occur in people with AFib are due to clots that form in this thing. Right? And so what you really want to do is figure out, is the blood in this thing moving around? Like, is it getting mixed and then gets shot back out again? And if it isn't, then that patient is a really high risk for stroke or higher risk for stroke and should be on some kind of blood thinner. Uh, that is not done right now. What they use is called a chad vas score, which I'll show you. what. The, this is the chad vas score. You get points for each, like your age, sex, if you have hypertension, have you had a stroke, vascular disease history, and diabetes. It's like, none of that has anything to do with the left atrial appendage. 
but it's just statistics that you have on everybody, right? So I, there's a, a lot of room for improvement in medicine. Right? Uh, what you can do, this is the left atrial appendage rendered from a CT, and this is uh, the cage of a closure device, which has, a, has sort of a cloth cover on it, and you can stick it in there and just shut it off. It's like a plug. You stick it in with, with these tines going inwards and expand it and just plug, plug the thing off and then detach. And then you know nothing's coming out of that atrial appendage, right? And so CT is used by really advanced centers to plan how you insert this device. What angle approach, how big a device you need, you know, whether or not the, the patient is going to be able to even have that device. Uh, the manufacturer of this device uses or recommends transesophageal echocardiography for this procedure, which is great because it's in the lab and it's real time, but not good for estimating geometries and things like that. It, it actually isn't great. Uh, same is said for a CT. There's a ton of CT done for planning uh, the minimally invasive insertion of a new aortic valve. So if your aortic valve is, is having trouble opening because of calcifications on it and other things, uh, they can insert retrograde using a catheter, this thing that crimps down, and then they just blow it up inside uh, your aorta right here, just inflate it, and it sticks to the sides and you've got a new aortic valve. Just just happens like that. All right? So no crack in the chest or anything. It's called TAVR. And uh, it's you know, now for cardiac CT, it's a huge number of patients are, are getting high resolution CTs in order to plan this therapy. So you can see the geometry and where it's going to go and everything. So those are some major applications of CT in the chest anyway. Other thing is, this is a, an actual LVAD. It's an artificial pump. It's a heart mate. And uh, is implanted in the patient to keep them alive essentially. Uh, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of hardware here. And you're not going to image this with the echo or with MR. You're not going to put this thing in an MR scanner, right? But an echo, you're getting echoes off every of these metallic surfaces and everything. But CT, you see it really well, and you can get great function with the thing in place and stuff like that. So uh, it's a nice use of CT as well. Okay, I thought we could briefly, if we can get it to work, just look at the simulation of that stuff we did with MATLAB. Was anyone interested in looking at some of those programs together? Yeah, just, just run them a couple of times, just see what, what you can do with them. So um, this is that radon demo, uh, PSF versus position. Okay, and so what we did here was we just made essentially one pixel dots as our as our image right and then looked at um, the raw data how it changes with you know changing sampling and then how it changes with signal to noise right and what the images look like so I'll just run a few examples let's set the signal to noise quite high let's say it's 25 right and um, I think I'll, let's just run it, see what happens. Okay, so here, here they come. Uh, so the original image, so let's go to the window, they should be labeled. Yeah, here's our original picture. Looks like this. So it's just these dots, right? So this is kind of like a, a, a delta function or what you can get as a delta function here. If I look at one of these, right, it's pretty simple. It's just one pixel that has a, a value of one, right? And uh, you can, if you want to look at the values, you can use this little data tool thing here and click on it, and it will tell you, okay, I've got a value of 1, and outside here i got a value of 0. All right? And so if you haven't found this data tool thing, it's very, very useful. So that's our, our input image. Right? And now let's look at the parameters of the run. Or here we've got 180 views, 1 degree each. Signal to noise 25, okay? Um, now we look at the noise-free reconstruction. So we've taken, first let's look at the raw data. Oh, I'm sorry. Window. Okay. 
to be wrong language. Okay, so here's GL theta, right? This is, and this is after the filtering. Do I have one without filtering? Yeah, so here's the original GL theta. Okay, let's bring it up. Okay, now does everyone understand what's going on here? This is, this is an essential thing you should, if you take away nothing else, you should understand this picture. Okay, and let's think back to the, the um, what's in the image, right? It was these dots, okay? And each one of those dots in the GL theta space, right, as we are projecting down, it's going to project down to a single dot or pixel on GL theta, right? And then as I rotate theta, as I rotate my projections along, that dot's going to move along in the L, you know, back and forth along the L direction as I rotate around. So the easiest one to understand what it is is this one. So which dot is that in our original image? Right in the middle. Right, because it's not changing. It's just always in the middle. I look up, I rotate, I look up, I rotate. It's always in the middle, right? And so, if I this is my L direction, right? This is theta as I'm increasing, and that guy stays in the middle the whole way, right? So, what are these three? Let's go back to the image. Let's see if I can find the image. Uh, oh yeah, that's what I want. No. Original image. Okay. Okay. Here's our original image. Oh, but it's go back to the home home look. Does anybody know how to get rid of these once you start using them? Really? No, not on my computer. Huh. Okay. Maybe in the maybe in the Windows version, but I I have a difficulty getting rid of them once I start doing them. And I I. Yeah, I just click over here. Oops, my bad. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you actually have to be selected with the arrow. With this guy? No, 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 no. on the this? Floor, that guy. Yeah. All right, let's try that. Now right click it? Nope. Close. Okay. So here's our original image. Okay. And we already know what this one looks like in the GL theta space. Right, this was the straight line across the middle, didn't change, right? It's L value as a function of theta. That makes sense. And then we had the three sine waves, right? Right? And so that's these three. They all started together. Right? Let's go back to the uh, here. So we have three of them starting together, and they're in line with the central one, right? And then as theta uh, changes, they shift along the L direction, right? Because they're displaced, obviously. And which one is which? Okay, the bottom one here, the distance to the center here is the one that's farthest away. And that makes sense, right? Because as as I go around and I get an orthogonal projection with all three of them in there, the one that's the farthest out now is going to be this one. So therefore, what is encoded at, at this position, right, is it's, that it's, it's displacement, right? So this, the amplitude of this sine wave gives you how far out you are radially, right? So if I have a lot of stuff out in the periphery, I'm going to have very high amplitude sine waves are going to be there. So if we think of a CT image as a set of these dots, right? So I have 256 by 256 or 64K dots. I have 64K of these things right, in my data, just these sine waves going through there. The amplitude gives me their radial position. Right? It was a sine wave. And so what position do I need other than the radial position then? <coughs> yeah? So if the axis uh, represented the sine lines, they're always going to be uh, from the upper, most, the upper left? 
Yeah, so this this is the theta direction, right? This is the L direction. I think it's I think it's labeled on the in the plots in the in the um, thing. It's not labeled here though. Um, so this is L and this is theta. Okay. Okay. Um, and you can figure out what theta equals zero means by just changing the picture to and get the first set of dots here and say, okay, that's my theta equals zero. Because okay. it's kind of arbitrary. You could start pretty well anywhere, and as long as you went 180 degrees, you'd, you'd still reconstruct a picture. Yeah. So a ground kind of for the Omar, I mean, I could change the filter. Yes. It didn't change for PSF. So it didn't change the PSF? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, we'll, ch we'll try that real quick. All right, so amplitude of this sine wave gives the position basically out radially. And the phase of the sine wave gives its position along the theta direction. Right? So all of these ones start together, right? Because they, So they're all sort of lined up with theta zero. If I click over at a certain angle, uh, that's when I'm, I'm going to see other things in that line come together. Right? All right. Uh, let's we, I think what we want to do now is try, so you want to try doing a yeah, filter? I, I changed it to the red line, and um, I didn't see any differences. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's set the noise, we'll set the signal to noise to something low, like three, right? So, so this means like the signal to noise in the data space of the line of data that's going along versus the background noise is three. Okay, so we hit go. So this is what your data looks like now. All right, so it's got a lot of hash on it, a lot of noise, right? And uh, when you look at the image quality of, of the reconstruction, it looks like this. Right? And this is, let's see what we did uh, from a filtering standpoint. I don't know why. You don't know what it was? Is that what I want? Yeah. So if I go down here, I think we put in the ability to filter, right? So smoothing is one. Let's take smoothing off first. Just take it off. We're not going to do any smoothing. We just have the Hamming filter on, right? Hit it, run it. So here, this is what our, our data looks like with no filtering, right? no smoothing of the, of the raw data. Right? And so it looks fairly you know, um, constant, sort of like it's like a translational. Uh, so if I look, I can look closely at the point spread function here and just measure my pixel values and how it's blurring. Right? Um, to, to get an idea of what that uh, point spread function looks like. Now if I go back um, here, and we're going to turn smoothing on, and okay, the, this filter is essentially averaging every three data points in the theta direction as you run along. So now we want to average Right, as opposed to um, just taking a specific value, we'll say that value is that value plus its two neighbors averaged. That's a smoothing, right? So that's actually gonna that's convolving just with a a, a rect function of a value of a third, right? So we'll do that smoothing, and we'll see what it does to our our data. So it made the data have sort of a lower noise level in the sense that the, it's actually smoothed it in this direction, right? It didn't, smoothing in this direction doesn't affect this guy at all in terms of its breadth, but it does affect these, right? So when you look at the, at the result, you get this radially dependent, right, blurring. And so now the point spread function of this thing is a lot broader right, in this direction than, than this one. OK, we're going to have to quit there. Sorry. But, um, 
if you want to, so all the, all of those uh, MATLAB functions, that, that's the way you play with them. You just go in there and those things that you can change, you just change them and see what happens. And they should just, like, every time you make a change, just run it again, all the pictures come up, take a look. Thank mm -hmm. you.